Hi guys, my name is Yeti Alamide Adiburn and welcome back to Living Life with Your Favorite Nurse. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, subscribe! So thank you guys so much for tuning in today. I got a lot of good feedback from Pharmacology Part 1, so I said I had to come out with Part 2 as soon as I can because, you know, a lot of people have their exams coming up. So here it is and let's get started. So last week we covered a couple things, antibiotics, cardiac meds, diuretics, maybe something else I can't remember, but if you haven't watched it, definitely go watch part one, and then you can watch part two or vice versa, it doesn't really matter, but just make sure that you watch both. Again, I got a lot of this info from New World and Mark K. Um, I think they're both great resources. Maybe you might not be able to get your hands on Mark K or New World, so I thought this would be a good way to give people info, you know, if they weren't able to get it or just haven't had the time to go through everything. So in this video, I'll also talk about how questions can be framed and how some questions were framed on my NCLEX exam as well. So let's start with diabetic drugs. So MPH is basal long acting. For this one, remember that you can never put this one in an IV bag and, you know, give it as a drip to someone because it precipitates. So know that anytime the question asks you um, which insulin or which type of diabetic drug you put in an IV to give to a client, maybe if they were going through ketoacidosis, it would not be this drug. So remember, never give this drug through IV. You also wouldn't give this drug at bedtime as well because it can cause hypoglycemia. Now, Lantus. This is a drug that can be given at bedtime. Because there isn't a crazy peak or anything, it doesn't cause hypoglycemia, so you will see this one given at bedtime a lot. So with this one, there is little risk for hypoglycemia. Now for your regular insulin or for your Humulin R, this one is the best to put in the IV. If you want to get someone out of ketoacidosis fast and you need a quick change, you need a quick intervention, this is the one that you would put in the IV bag. This is the one that you would want to use in an immediate situation. Remember R, R for rapid. This is one that you would need to use in a rapid situation. Now Aspart or Humalog, this one is also short acting. So this one you would want to give to a patient when they're just about to eat, as they're just eating. You don't want to give this to someone if you don't know they're not going to eat. So a question might ask you, um, give this medication to a client 30 minutes before they eat. That is not what you want to do because it's short acting. It's going to happen fast. You want to do it as they're eating. And in a case that you give it to them and, again, they don't eat, their insulin is going to go down. So ensure at least the patient will be eating in the next 15 minutes. So again, basically give it to them just as they're eating, just before, just as they're about to take a bite, if you can. Psych drugs, yay. So I don't really like psych drugs, of course, because there's just so many of them, but let's go through them together. So know that one thing about psych drugs is weight gain and hypotension is honestly a very common side effect, and it isn't something to worry about. If you do get a question, that a patient has been on this drug and they're experiencing weight gain, it is not um, it is not a statement to make you panic. Know that that is normal for most or all um, psych drugs. Hypotension, again, is also something that you'll see in a lot of psych drugs. Again, that is not something you need to worry about if they give you a question like, which would cause you immediate alarm. Hypotension or weight gain should not be anything that like makes you go crazy. It is a typical side effect. All right, so let's start with SSRIs. So those are basically like your prams. I'll put names up. Just remember there's contraindications, I suck at saying that word, with um, St. John's wart syndrome or whatever. So don't give it to someone with St. John's wart something. So SSRIs has like the typical psych drug um, symptoms, but know that insomnia is a symptom of SSRIs. It's not a huge deal. I would only say it's a huge deal sometimes. Remember that with SSRIs, they can be more prone for suicide as they have more energy and things like that. So now imagine that someone is not sleeping, they're up all the time, you know, that gives them time to plan what they wanna do, how they wanna hurt themselves and things like that. So you'd also wanna see how their mood is as well if they're not sleeping and see if there's any assistance that you can give them to get to sleep. But also, again, let's say a kid was started on this. You're telling their parents that, you know, you do want to monitor them 
you know, now that they have more energy to make sure that they don't go through with any plans that they have. Also because it does cause hypotension, you know, just encourage them to not get up too fast or anything like that because if they do stand up and they become hypotensive, they will end up on the floor. So SNRIs, basically the same things I said as well for the SSRIs. Another thing I just forgot to add is you wouldn't want to give this med at bedtime or you wouldn't want to encourage that this med is taken at bedtime because it does cause insomnia. So for both of them, just make sure that whoever's taking them or if you're giving teaching advice, it wouldn't be at bedtime. That can be another NCLEX question. MAOIs, again, I don't know what, if that's how you pronounce these names, but that's just kind of how I've always pronounced them. So, so if it's wrong, I'm so sorry. So I'll put the names up of these ones. I really, really suck at drug pronunciations. So just, just see the names that I put up. So if someone takes the MOIs with um, basically SSRIs, that could be a risk of serotonin syndrome. So make sure that these meds aren't being given together. Also, if these meds are taking with TACAs, that can cause a hypertensive crisis. So just know those two things and how they interact. So this med is given as a last resort um, with someone with depression. With this med, one major thing that you will see in a lot of um, the NCLEX practice stuff is this med cannot be mixed with thyramine foods. Remember bar, bananas, avocados, and raisins. Also chocolate is one of them, but bar is just those like really common ones. Processed meat, chocolate, and organ meats, okay? So that's a typical NCLEX question. I may or may have not have gotten that one. Can't remember. So tacos, as I said with the MAOIs, um, again, don't mix them together because that will cause hypertensive crisis. So mood stabilizers, so basically like lithium, uh, quintipine, and other drugs, again, I'll put them there. So with mood stabilizers, especially lithium, you would want them to avoid um, anything, well the patients, you would want the patients to avoid really anything um, that's like a diuretic, so cola, coffee, or tea. Because any form of dehydration um, can cause lithium toxicity. Um, you'd probably have to check the actual sodium thing going on because I actually can't remember. But just know that any form of dehydration can cause lithium toxicity. Um, maybe because they have too much sodium or they don't have enough sodium. Don't quote me on that because I can't remember. So just check that. Um, so I guess you'd want them to stay hydrated as much as possible. Maybe not over hydrated again, but just, just normal if that's a thing, okay? So I'd say you want them to have a regular fluid intake if possible. Not over, not less. So a normal person should have six to eight glasses a day. That is something that we know. So for benzodiazepines, um, these definitely have the anticholinergic effect. So make sure that you kind of just know that um, for any possible question about which symptoms um, are common, such as no, for benzodiazepines, these will also cause solemnness. So this person would just be like really fatigued, really kind of tired, really calm. Um, it's like a tranquilizer, really. Benzos are contraindicated in people with glaucoma. So just remember that. I saw that in a lot of like practice um, NCLEX questions. And also remember that this drug can also be used as anesthesia as well. And also know that this drug is not a long-term drug. Um, you wouldn't have someone on benzos for more than four weeks. So it's usually two to four weeks. So know that if someone was going home on benzos, the question that could be asked is, a parent is asking how long their kid would be on this drug, or a parent would say, oh, um, wow, now my kid will be on benzos for the rest of their life. Know that this is not a long-term drug that someone will be on. Barbiturates. Now, this is the real sedation. This is heavy, heavy sedation. Um, benzos were like a minor tranquilizer, but if you're trying to knock someone out, it would be a barbiturate. So your barbitals really. The only teaching thing for this one is just, if someone is on this, just make sure that they're being supervised in a way when they're walking, just because by chance they take this med and they plummet to the ground and things like that, or someone takes it at night and tries to get up to pee, just make sure that either they're being watched or, you know, they tell a family member that they're taking this med so they can just kind of have an eye out for them. People tend to take this med for insomnia and then they end up getting up and falling. So just know that they should be cautious of their movements if they can 
or ask someone to, you know, kind of just look out for them. Oh, with the barbiturates, I forgot. Make sure that this person is not driving. If someone says, okay, I'm going to take this med now and I'm going to drive myself home, that could be a question. Make sure that they aren't driving. If they have to go somewhere and they've taken um, a barbiturate, they should, you know, get someone else to drive them. They should not be driving. That is a huge one. All right, antipsychotics like haloperidol, risperidone very common um, antipsychotic meds. So basically these meds are kind of used to treat positive symptoms of kind of psychotic behavior. So like hallucinations, delusions, things like that. So these meds cause the EPS, EPS, is it extra pyramidal symptoms? Something like that. You guys know I don't know how to pronounce anything. So this causes the dystonia, the Parkinson's, and the rigidity. So know that those are side effects that could occur and you'd want to know that those can be caused by antipsychotic meds. So these meds are for some reason hard on your stomach. So if you can administer these meds with food, please do. I've seen practice questions about that. And I'm like, okay, like I'll remember that. Just remember antipsychotic meds, um, they're hard on the stomach. I don't know why, but they are. Some of these meds could also change the color of your pee or your urine. So that might be a question that a client is called and they said that they're their urine is like a pinkish color, which tends to happen. Um, let them know that that is a side effect of taking some of these meds. It isn't something crazy. As long as they're not having like severe blood in the urine, um, it's okay that the color of the urine may change. So neural malignant syndrome. <laughs> um, so this can be caused by Haldol. So that is an altered mental status. So lethargy, um, decrease in LOC, muscle rigidity, and hypothermia. This is not something that you'll be like, oh, um, I'm not doing well, and you'll be like, oh, I'm fine. No, this is a problem. You need to get them into the hospital, or if they're already in the hospital, you need to call the doctor that this is a problem. So basically for this, you'd have to, one, control their temp. So treatment for this, you definitely want to control their temp, obviously. Um, if they were having severe agitation, you'd give them benzos. And you have to give them a drug to decrease um, the dopamine levels. Definitely, I think that question might be a little bit more complex, so they might not ask something like that. Just remember that you'd want to um, treat them for all the symptoms that are occurring, and they're just not something that you'd be like, oh, they're fine. So that happens with antipsychotic meds, Haldol in particular. Oh my gosh, we finished psych meds. Oh, Lord. Okay, let's keep going. Respiratory medications. This one is not too bad, so let's do it. So for the first one, bronchodilators. So these basically dilate the airway and cause a sympathetic response to the body. So remember that. Because they do cause a sympathetic response in the body, um, it can cause tachycardia and hypertension. So know that that is kind of a side effect of taking them. Also palpations, which is not that great. Always assess, you know, lung sounds and everything, and this drug would be given as a rescue drug you would not just be giving someone this um, just because. So you could be giving this to someone with like acute asthma exacerbation. Okay, so anticholinergics. These also cause a sympathetic response to the body. But with this drug, it also dries out your secretions. So this person may have dry mouth, urinary retention, and they also have blurred vision. I have to just read this one to you guys because it always just leaves my brain. So clients with peanut allergy should not take this drug because it contains soya, which is the same plant family as peanuts. So remember that one. That was something that I saw on I Think You World. It was like I had no idea. So I had to write that down for you guys because it could come up. You know, maybe don't like put it in the front of your brain. Just have it somewhere in your head. This drug is also contraindicated um, with people with glaucoma as well. It also causes um, hypertension, so remember that. So glucocorticoids. So this is basically, this one can be used for long inflammation of someone with asthma, but remember that this actually causes immunosuppression. So make sure that this person is monitored for infection, um, whether they were in the hospital and getting it or taking it in the community, just let them be aware that if they spike a fever, if they're not feeling well, that they should go to the hospital or go get checked out just because they are more prone of infections because their immune system has been lowered. By chance, if they were in the hospital and getting this and I did lab work and I saw that their white blood cells were high, I know that we have a problem. 
So just remember that. That would be like for prednisone. But antihistamines, so basically like your allergy um, medicines, um, of course they cause drowsiness, but I guess you can find the ones that don't in the stores. But typically they do cause drowsiness and fatigue. So you wouldn't want someone to take these and drive, especially if they are the ones that make someone drowsy. If taken with alcohol, opioids, barbiturates, they can cause CNS depression. So make sure that you give the teaching so that they shouldn't be taking these meds with opioids or alcohol. And also this would be a good question to know the client's history of what they're taking because you wouldn't want them to be taking this med and also barbiturate together. So opioid antagonists, I said that right? So naloxone. So remember with this med, after you give naloxone, the effects of the med can come back and you can use naloxone again. So remember that you can like use um, naloxone and they can be fine and they can go right back, you know, to their um, opioid depression or their overdose. That you can give naloxone again one, more than once. So remember that you can give it to them and they can end up going back um, into their overdose state and you can give it to them again. You can give this one via nasal or you can give this one IM. I don't know how many questions they have about naloxone on UWorld, um, but that's just something you guys can, you know, just remember for yourselves as well. All right, so we kind of finished those key things. I just want us to go over commonly tested drugs. Again, I saw a lot of these in UWorld. And I remember some of these from my exam as well, so let's just go over them. So for anticonvulsants, I'll put um, the name of the drug that I'm thinking of that's just not coming to my brain. But just remember that you know how much it's toxic. It may have changed since I did my NCLEX exam last year, but just make sure you know the current toxicity level. And also know that it does cause um, hyperplasia of the gums. So this person taking it would need to have good dental hygiene. Um, there can be a lot of bleeding, there could be a lot of swelling in the mouth. So for NSAIDs like naproxen or Tylenol, know that any form of teri stools or tari stools, however it's pronounced, um, would be a GI bleed. You'd want to get them off any NSAIDs. Um, also, what did I have in my brain? Also, which I actually didn't learn in school, but I learned when studying for the NCLEX, that NSAIDs actually do cause sodium retention and does cause hypertension. Well, maybe I did learn this in school. But anyways, um, NSAIDs are actually contraindicated with anyone with CHF because of the sodium retention and because of the hypertension that it would cause. So with the TARI stools or with the TARI stools and the GI bleed, make sure that you're kind of teaching them to take NSAIDs with medication to avoid it, you know, just hurting the insides of your stomach and causing a GI bleed. There is, of course, a bleeding risk with taking NSAIDs with aspirin, so just remember that as well. So for proton pump inhibitors, um, like um, the something Prazols, I'll put the name up, but anyone taking these meds are actually um, at risk of a C. diff infection just because um, you're reducing the amount of acid in your stomach, so you've just kind of lost that protection. So just remember they're more prone for a C. diff infection. All right, so we're just rounding out some extra tips. Do not administer benzos or barbiturates, things that, um, any meds that cause solemnness in someone with an increased ICP because it can mask the solemnness that they're actually occurring or change in level of consciousness, you know, if they're kind of going under. If you give them those meds, you may think it's the meds, but it actually might be the increased ICP, and that would be an emergency um, that would be occurring with the patient. So don't give any of those serious sedatives. Um, to people with an increased ICP. All right, guys, so that rounds up pharmacology part two. This was a lot, and my brain actually hurts. Um, I hope that this part two was helpful for everybody. And again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know. Definitely like this video, subscribe, and comment and share with your friends. I hope everyone has an absolute blessed week, and I hope anyone who has their exam coming up or coming up soon all the best and you will do amazing and you will become a nurse soon enough. Um, again, thank you for watching. Have a great week and keep living life from your favorite nurse.